previously on CoffeeZilla. This case isn't an ordinary one. For all the crypto you've been talking about lately, you've overlooked the biggest fraud of all. What do you mean? Have you ever heard of a coin called Tether? No, seriously, what do you know about Tether? That wasn't rhetorical. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to be cool. Well, stop it. It's cringe. Okay, okay. Um, wait, what was the question again? Never mind. I'll just tell you. Imagine for a second you had a money printer, a real one. So, basically the government. Mm, correct. But imagine it's not controlled by a centralized government. Imagine it's owned offshore, unaudited, unaccountable. That's impossible. No one would ever accept that currency. Tether is that money printer. Only a few days ago, one billion dollars worth of Tether was printed out of thin air. Before that, a billion more. It's in circulation today. <sighs> I think I need another drink. Sorry, explain this from the beginning. How does Tether work? No problem, but you're gonna need a lot more than one drink. Uh, I need some coffee. Oh, no, no. Okay, come on, Steven. What time is it? Oh boy. All right, we gotta gotta make this video already. Uh, come on. Remember why you do this. Okay, okay. Come on, we can do this. We can do this. Hey guys, welcome to another. Hey guys, welcome to an- Come on! Come on, Steven! Got a video to make, okay. Hey guys, welcome to a special episode inside of the $10 million studio. Today, we have a very special episode. <clears throat> if my head would stop pounding for a second. Sorry, you wouldn't believe the night I had even if I told you. But none of that matters, okay, look. Because I gotta get this video out. After all, I, I always remind myself why I do this. For the fans. So, today we need to talk about Tether. Tether is suspicious. Maybe it's not fully backed. They're creating more out of thin air and then using that to buy and accumulate Bitcoin. Because there is no transparency in Tether. That's the problem, is they were issuing Tether in whenever it was needed out of thin air. It was not backed by dollars. There might be a fair amount of gambling mentality coming into that trust. Tether is a cryptocurrency that, well, the best I can explain it is either deeply misunderstood or the biggest fraud in the world. In this video, I want to lay out evidence and let you decide for yourself. Is Tether a fraud? Legally, I can't say that it is, you know, but if it is, and that is a big, juicy, legally compliant if, it's about to be bigger than Bernie Madoff. For context, Bernie Madoff's victims lost $64.8 billion. The current value of Tether is $62 billion, and at its current rate of growth, it climbs a $1 billion every four days. By the time you're watching this, the value of Tether will be more than Madoff ever had in investor funds. Now, if it's not fraud, and that is possible, this video will be about bureaucratic incompetence and lies. Now, maybe this is the first time you're hearing of Tether or stablecoins, and you're thinking, I don't hold any Tether, so I don't have to worry about this video, right? I'll just hold Bitcoin. But here's the problem. Even if you're not invested in Tether, you are exposed to the fallout of a Tether crash, whether you realize it or not. See, Tether is the backbone of liquidity in the crypto market. It's one of the main ways people buy cryptocurrencies, and it's the largest crypto buy trading volume, even bigger than Bitcoin. So if Tether disappears overnight, all that liquidity disappears, and the price of crypto could come crashing down. All crypto, not just Tether. So that's my quick soft pitch for why Tether is important and why you should sit here and listen to what is probably gonna be a very long video, which at times will feel like the accompanying audiobook to this image. All right, before we get started, I wanna do some real quick housekeeping and address some criticisms right off the bat. This video will be labeled, unfortunately, as FUD by most of the crypto world. This is an acronym crypto fans use to dismiss criticism. It means fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But the way crypto influencers use it, you'd think it was more like an enchanting spell to keep the mean old bear market away. Here's how the average crypto YouTuber will respond when you show them this video. But there's also more FUD. The latest FUD, I should say. I'm gonna go dress the FUD. I think it's just FUD. And also why I think uh, we should ignore it. It's all FUD all the time. Bad FUD. I do not like that FUD. I do not agree with that FUD. I will ignore that FUD. <laughs> Look, you don't have to agree with my opinions on Tether 
or conclude that it's a fraud in this video. As I said, I'm happy if you decide either way. All I ask is you keep an open mind and watch the whole video before deciding you were right all along. Number two, this video is not attacking crypto as a whole. I'm still invested in multiple tokens and I plan to stay that way. This is because I'm invested in crypto for the long haul and I think in the five to 10 year time horizon, this won't matter. If it does matter, <laughs> Well, we're all going to, down together, boys. I mean, that's all I can say. But that said, I do think it matters in the short term. I think Tether matters a whole lot. And the bigger Tether is allowed to grow unchecked, the greater risk they pose to the crypto ecosystem as a whole. All right, with those things out of the way, let me explain Tether as fast as I can. Okay, so first things first, what is Tether? First, we should distinguish that Tether Limited is the company that produces Tether coins. Tether coins, or simply Tethers, are what is known as a stable coin in crypto. They call it a stable coin because that's exactly what it's supposed to be, stable. One USDT, for example, is always supposed to be worth exactly $1, stable, get it? Now, technically, stable coins can be pegged to anything. You can have a stable coin for a euro. You can have a stable coin for gold. You can have a stable coin for anything. And stable coins are useful for a lot of reasons. They let you get around regulation easier. You can keep US cash on foreign crypto exchanges and many other fancy things. But back when Tether was created in 2014, it was the first of its kind. Early on, this was Tether's number one claim. Every Tether is always backed one-to-one -one by traditional currency held in our reserves. So one USDT is equivalent to one USD. And how it was supposed to work in theory was that you would give Tether $1 and they'd mint you one tether. You could then go spend that tether on crypto or whatever you wanted. And if you ever wanted to redeem that tether, you could go back to Tether Limited, the company, give them your tether and they'd give back to you your $1. And then they'd burn that tether token so it doesn't exist anymore. Thus maintaining the exact balance of money in tethers reserves to the number of tethers that have been issued. In theory, that's how it's supposed to work. Here comes the first sign of trouble. See people started to notice that actually, in Tether's terms of service, Tether doesn't actually have to redeem anything if they don't want to. It's literally in writing. Right here, Tether reserves the right to delay the redemption or withdrawal of Tether tokens. Then again, if you didn't believe me, even more specifically, Tether reserves the right to redeem Tether tokens by in-kind redemptions of securities. In other words, if you decide you don't want these Tethers anymore and want them redeemed by Tether, as was always intended, they do not have to give you your money back. But look, 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 I can hear you guys already. I'm sure you're saying, look, this is just FUD. Just FUD, ignore it. Everything's fine as long as the money's there, right? Thank goodness Tether is a transparent company that publishes their reserves daily. Only wait a minute, this section has been changed. See, going to the Wayback Machine back in 2017, Tether promised that their reserve holdings are published daily and are subject to frequent professional audits. Whoops, it's actually been half a decade and there hasn't been a single audit. So I guess the boys decided it was better to scrub that from the website real quick and change it. But don't worry guys, some of the executives at Tether are willing to assure us that there's no cause for alarm. The money's there. I agree that could be handled better, um, but um, I can. all I can say is that money's there. I promise you that. Money's there, we promise you that. I'm sure that's the thing crypto fans love to hear. You know, the same people who made their rallying cry, don't trust, verify. Yeah, I'm sure promises are basically the same thing, right? But don't blame Tether, it's not their fault. See, if you keep playing that call we were just listening to, you'll hear the real reason for the lack of an audit. And, you know, we're constantly looking for solutions to, to make that more transparent. It's not that easy. You know, uh, there's so much negativity surrounding it that nobody nobody wants to touch it. Auditors don't want to work with us. Other people, it's just, I don't know what really, well, quite what to say about it. I mean, it's like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Everybody looking at it actually affects the system. That's right. If you look too close at their funds, they might just vanish. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Maybe it's more like Madoff's uncertainty principle. But according to Tether, that really is the reason they haven't been audited in six years. It's that securing an audit from a top auditor is difficult. They simply can't find one. But that actually isn't true. The truth is they actually had an auditor, someone ready to do an audit, someone named Friedman LLP. But in 2018, Tether bailed in the middle of the audit, complaining that Friedman was being too, and I'm quoting here, excruciatingly detailed. Um, yes, you heard me right. The reason an offshore digital dollar printer can't get an audit is not because they couldn't find one, it's because the auditor that actually agreed to it 
was asking for too much information. Sorry guys, no audit today. Too busy changing the financial system. Look, audits are too time consuming, according to Tether. But don't worry, even though Tether doesn't have to redeem your crypto bucks, and even though they've never been audited despite saying they would be, it's actually the least of your worries. See, you should get really concerned when another shady company enters the picture with ties to Tether. That company is Bitfinex. And I know what you're thinking, another stupid name that's confusing, and I get it. Writing the script, it's kind of like trying to explain the plot of a Christopher Nolan movie, and not the good one. Just bear with me, okay? Bitfinex is a crypto exchange like Coinbase, and early on, it was the most popular crypto exchange where people could buy and sell cryptocurrencies. Pretty soon, people got pretty suspicious of the ties of Tether and Bitfinex. Bitfinex was the first and main exchange where Tethers were traded for a long time. So people began thinking, if, let's just say, somehow, the largest crypto exchange and largest stablecoin were somehow in bed together, that'd be kind of bad. Because after all, an exchange could collude with that stablecoin to get to a place where they're basically infinitely printing tethers, using those tethers to go buy Bitcoin on the exchange they own, and it'd always be worth a dollar on that exchange, use them to back those tethers or convert it to USD, and then you just never redeem the tethers. Huge pile of cash from absolutely nowhere. Crypto certainly wouldn't be new to such a complicated scheme. Mt. Gox and Quadriga CX were both crypto exchanges that used their ownership to profit and ultimately rip off a lot of people. They both eventually went bust. So people were understandably concerned and they asked directly, are Bitfinex and Tether owned by the same people? And of course, Bitfinex and Tether replied with the tried and true strategy of everyone who has nothing to hide. They lied. Here's Chief Strategy Officer Phil Potter denying this, saying the Tether and Bifinex, they just banked at the same bank. So people that people that are confused right now, basically Tether is Phoenix, right? Uh, no, it's not, but we bank with the same banks. Ah, oh, this has to be the worst excuse of all time. Oh, we just, we bank at the same banks. No relation. We just see each other in line withdrawing huge sums of cash. No, we just say hi to each other across, across little cubicles. <laughs> <laughs> Look, fast forward to 2017, of course, the truth comes out after the Paradise Papers are released. You know, those like major leak of offshore shell company documents. It turns out one of the companies leaked in that was Tether. And it was revealed that in fact, Bitfinex and Tether weren't just in bed together, they were owned by the same people. That's right, Phil Potter and Juan Carlo Devasini both had their names on Tether's incorporation. And here's Phil Potter later revising his lie. We Bitfinex are majority owners of, of, Bitf of, of Tether. This is true. But Tether is a completely segregated entity. Um, dollars are all there. Isn't it so funny that he always has to reassure people, hey, do dollars are there. Now at this point, I think it's becoming obvious that the owners of Bitfinex and Tether aren't exactly your typical executives. So I'd like to introduce you guys to exactly who's behind these two companies, which are basically the same company. They're owned by the same people. Because at its heart, this is really a story about trust. Can Tether or Bitfinex be trusted? We've already established multiple lies. But now let's look at the background of these individuals. I contacted a man named Bennett Tomlin for this. He investigates fraud full time and is currently writing an entire book about Tether. I asked him to break down the background of these individuals. And here's what he told me. Bitfinex was founded in uh, 2013 by Raphael Nicolay. By day was a help desk technician and by night spent his time looking on Bitcoin talk for Ponzi schemes he could participate in. Famously, he lost a bunch of his Bitcoin in the Trend and Shavers Ponzi scheme, which was later brought down by the Department of Justice. And then he tried to start his own high yield lending program where people could lend him their Bitcoins and he would use what he called arbitrage to earn them a guaranteed 2% per week on their Bitcoins. After people were not interested in giving their money to a Ponzi schemer, he decided to start Bitfinex. He was later joined at Bitfinex by Juan Carlo Davicini currently the chief financial officer for both Bitfinex and Tether, who previously was a software pirate. He got in trouble for selling pirated Microsoft uh, software. And that was a lot of money, wasn't it? Like that he got in trouble for? No, it was a relatively small amount. Uh, it, 
it's a currency conversion factor makes it seem bigger than it was. It was like, I want to say it was like 18 million lira, which at the time converted to, I want to say like 100,000 USD. So it was a relatively small fine for that. Yeah, and so then they were later joined by uh, Phil Potter, who for a long time was the chief strategy officer of Bitfinex. He came from the New York financial scene. Um, he was once profiled in a New York Times piece where he bragged about his wealth and how much money he was making. And very shortly after that, he lost his position at Morgan Stanley. And then Tether was started by initially a different cast of characters, led by Brock Pierce. Brock Pierce was a famous child actor who starred in films like The Mighty Ducks. He's more known for fleeing to Spain with indicted child sexual predator Mark Collins Rector, where both of them ended up getting arrested in a house full of child pornography. Um, he started initially Realcoin, which became Tether, along with a couple of other people who he had previously worked with, including Jonathan Yantis, who helped him at IGE, which was a company that started surrounding farming MMO items. So they would hire out people in various countries to earn these items and then would sell them. Secondary market. Yeah. And then Realcoin was bought out by Bitfinex and became Tether and when it was incorporated, had basically the same executive team as Bitfinex. What can you tell us about Paulo, who later joined the team? Paulo is a little bit interesting because he doesn't have the same kind of past that some of these other characters do. Him and his wife, Claudia, who is the chief operating officer for Bitfinex, both joined in, I want to say 2015. Um, they both had a previous history as fintech developers, and as far as I can tell, they seem to be competent fintech developers. Uh, the most interesting thing to me about Paulo is one, that it's him and his wife working together for Bitfinex and Tether, and two, that, so there was a document leaked that at one point uh, Bitfinex leaked that showed that Paulo was one of the directors for Delchain, which is the uh, it's a cryptocurrency focused offshoot of Deltek Bank, which is where Tether now banks. And so it seems that Paulo might be connected pretty deeply to Tether's bank. Tell me about Stu Hogner, their general counsel. So yeah, Stuart Hogner is the general counsel for Bitfinex and Tether. He has a history in cryptocurrency and also in online gambling. He was the director of compliance at Excapa, which was a online poker company most known for being the parent company for Ultimate Bet. Ultimate Bet got in trouble because they were giving some of their players a god mode that allowed them to see the other poker's players' cards, which would obviously be an advantage if you're trying to play poker. So that happened uh, Well, Stu was the director of compliance for Xcapa, and then shortly thereafter he left. This is all shocking because these are the people sort of facilitating the currency that is the backbone of crypto. Um, it's like the leading liquidity provider. And what you're telling me is these are not savory individuals for the most part. That's exactly what I'm telling you. <sighs> this is starting to look bad, huh? But don't worry, it gets way worse. Around 2017, okay, people began criticizing Tether sort of seriously for the first time. And it started with someone named Bitfinex on Twitter. Bitfinex has been by far the most vocal critic of Tether. And I interviewed him to ask him what made him first suspect something was wrong. Starting in late March 2017, I noticed unusual trading on Bitfinex that seemed to match the trading that I saw on Mt. Gox when Mt. Gox lost banking. I was alert but had nothing concrete about their banking situation until April the 5th, 2017, when Bitfinex attempted to sue Wells Fargo. Their lawsuit indicated that they, Bitfinex and Tether, had no banking at all, and despite this, Tether continued to issue tens of millions of dollars of Tether, despite Bitfinex and Tether being unable to receive transfers. I suspected fraud and started my Twitter account. Now, in response to this criticism, Tether panicked, and even though they would never end up getting an audit, they decide to release a third-party attestation to show that they really had funds in reserve to back up 
They're tethers. 400 million tethers, in fact. But real quick note, an attestation is not an audit. An audit is a detailed forensic look of your accounts. An attestation can be as simple as a peek into your bank account to see that the money's there for a very short amount of time. This is what that attestation looked like. Now, at the time, many saw this as proof that Tether was in fact backed. It sure looked like they had $400 million in the bank. And everyone in crypto also had good reason to want to believe this as well. Everybody was making money, to put it frankly. After all, the more money Tether printed, the higher Bitcoin's price would rise. So it was in everyone's interest who held Bitcoin, or crypto for that matter, to keep the gravy train going. The only problem was, with this attestation, it turns out that some funny business was going on. See, it was found out later in a New York Attorney General investigation that something very shady had happened. Tether had convinced their third party to conduct his attestation or snapshot on a very specific day, September 15th, 2017, with Noble Bank. On September 14th, the day before that happened, Tether didn't have an account with Noble Bank. On the day of the snapshot or attestation, Tether opened a bank account where they supposedly had reserves all along and Bitfinex, the other company, which they have nothing to do with, transferred $382 million into that account. That night, the attestation was done and everything appeared in order. But no one knew that the funds supposedly backing Tether arrived there that day. Suspiciously, the price of Bitcoin also suddenly fell by around 40 to 50% in the two weeks prior, leading some to believe that someone was selling bucket loads of Bitcoin. The price recovered immediately after the attestation and was the largest four hours of buying in Bitcoin's history on the same day. Don't forget that only minutes ago, Phil Potter claimed that Tether and Bitfinex were completely separate entities. But Tether is a completely segregated entity dollars are all there. But now we find that they're actually commingling funds. But even this ruse didn't save Bitfinex and Tether completely. They may have warded off public opinion for a little while, but their critics were growing louder than ever. The Friedman attestation was worthless and I called it as such at the time. But a big shadow loomed over the project that not even their critics could have seen coming. You see, around this time, Bitfinex and Tether were having banking issues. It wasn't uncommon for crypto companies to have trouble finding banks to work with. After all, some of the users of cryptocurrencies, especially early on, were quite sketchy, so banks didn't want to get involved. Nonetheless, if you're a crypto company, you need a bank to receive wire deposits. So Bitfinex decides to start relying on something called crypto capital. Now, this company probably deserves its own video, crypto capital, but suffice to say, they worked with a lot of, let's call it, um, needy clients, you know, people who couldn't go anywhere else besides a sketchy non-bank to bank with. People who needed their money moved without anyone knowing where it was from. I mean, I'll just say it, like money laundering basically. To put it into perspective for the types of people crypto capital were working with, the Colombian drug cartel were later implicated <laughs> with crypto capital. So we're talking some seriously sketchy uh, business partners here. But look, Bitfinex is desperate. They need banking. So they start working with them, depositing hundreds of millions of their clients' funds with them. And for a while, things were going great and smoothly. But this time, it would prove that Bitfinex and Tether were the ones who would be duped because they trusted somebody. See, the feds were onto crypto capital. After an illegal escort website called Backpage was busted, guess who was implicated? Well, you guessed it, crypto capital. And when the feds came knocking, everyone's funds got seized. I mean, we're talking the shell account funds, the ones holding Bitfinex's clients' money. Reports say that at this point, Bitfinex had $850 million frozen in this giant international money laundering case. And I mean, this is huge. According to internal documents in June, 2018, Bitfinex told their point of contact at Crypto Capital that over 80% of client funds were controlled by Crypto Capital. Translation, that's it. We're insolvent. If we can't get access to those funds that we deposited with Crypto Capital, we don't have the money. So Bitfinex is even more desperate than ever. They can't find a solution. They're about to blow up, just like so many crypto exchanges have done in the past. I mean, after all, there's no way to magically patch an $850 million hole in your balance sheet right? Absolutely wrong. Suddenly, Bitfinex realizes they have something no one else has ever had in their position. A flying Lamborghini. No, I'm just kidding. 
uh, they have a money printer. And this money printer also has massive private reserves. So rather than go bankrupt, Bitfinex instead takes $400 million from Tether's reserves. And suddenly they can meet withdrawals and not go out of business. They basically bailed themselves out is what I'm trying to tell you right now. And meanwhile, even though they're still short tons of cash, they proceed to lie to the public and issue a statement saying Bitfinex is not solvent and a constant stream of Medium articles claiming otherwise is not going to change this. Now again, they are insolvent. They don't have the money, but are we really surprised that they're lying yet again? Meanwhile, they're still trying to fight the bad press of all of this. And so they decide they need another attestation to show that their reserves are solid. To do this, they get another bank. Sorry, I know it's like a rotating cast of banks. Just go with me. This one's called Deltek, okay? Funny enough, one of the executives is actually the creator of Inspector Gadget, which is totally random and weird. But at this point, I could probably tell you anything and you'd believe me in this story because it's so insane. But anyways, they get this attestation from Deltek. And once again, they get back up to their old trick. See, on November 1st, 2018, Tether had Deltek give a public announcement that affirmed that Tether now had a balance of $1.8 billion in reserve. They had grown a lot by then, still making them backed one to one. However, after Deltek confirms this, November 2nd, Tether pays Bitfinex $475 million, you know, to help plug the hole that's still in Bitfinex's balance sheet and kind of make them whole again. Of course, it naturally follows if you just took $500 million from one company and hand it over to this one, Tether's not backed the next day after they claimed that they were backed. Of course, they lied because it's these guys, right? So shady. But of course, nobody could have possibly known that at the time. And we actually didn't find this out until the New York Attorney General's office released their investigation. This means that what Bitfinex and Tether set out to do succeeded, which is deceiving their customers to buy more time. This means unequivocally, at least on November 2nd, and who knows for how much longer, Tether was unbacked by US dollars. And around this time, interestingly, Tether decided that maybe it was time to move the goalposts again. So what did they do? Well, around 2019, yet again, Tether's website suddenly changed without warning. After spending five years claiming to be 100% backed by USD, they change it to this. Every Tether token is 100% backed by our reserves, not by US dollars, which include traditional currency and cash equivalents, and from time to time, may include other assets and receivables from loans made by Tether to third parties, which may include affiliated entities collectively reserves. Every Tether token is also one-to-one -one pegged to the dollar. So they're saying it's still pegged to the dollar. Now we don't really know why though, because they can basically loan an insolvent parent company or co-company money as much as they want to bail them out. So what exactly is receivable? If that company goes under, it's a disaster. But look, 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 I, I, I don't want to bog you down in explaining to you how completely insane that is. Uh, it's pretty obvious. The much more obvious question I think we can all ask ourselves now is who in their right mind would trust this company at this point? Tether and Bitfinex, owned by the same company, have repeatedly lied, omitted, and misled people. And we've only done a basic history of what's happened so far. 2021 hasn't been much better for them either. The New York Attorney General's office investigated Tether for two years. And as a part of a settlement, they were fined millions of dollars, banned from New York, and the Attorney General couldn't be more clear. They say Bitfinex recklessly and unlawfully covered up massive financial losses to keep their scheme going and protect their bottom lines. Tether's claims that its virtual currency was fully backed by US dollars at all times was a lie. Which, wow, that's, I mean, that's quite the statement. So I bet you're asking yourself, Tether finally fessed up, right? Like that, that must be it. That must be where this story ends. Like you'd be right in a normal world, but this is crazy land, right? Instead, Tether decides that to pretend basically this was all good news. And in yet another lie, but this time from their uh, general counsel, Stu Hogner, they said that the AG's office made no negative findings whatsoever the tethers were not fully back. That is completely wrong. Literally, the New York Attorney General said tethers claims that it was fully backed was a lie. Stu Hochner, the G general counsel says, oh, they never found anything, made no negative findings that tethers were not fully backed. 
Uh, so look, Tether and Bitfinex, even when caught lie by the New York Attorney General, still lie about what even that says. Now, of course, many might declare any kind of settlement for Tether at all a win. I mean, at least they weren't shut down and everything fell apart, right? So that, that might be true to some extent. But don't forget, if this is a complicated fraud scheme, it wouldn't be unprecedented for regulators to fail to shut it down for a long time. Remember uh, this guy? Bernie Madoff himself was discovered early on by independent researchers, but the SEC investigated and cleared him multiple times before the fraud unraveled. But regardless of what you think about whether Tether is guilty or innocent here, one thing is clear. Tether's money printer is running at an all-time high. At the beginning of this year, there were 20 billion Tether in circulation. Right now, there's 62 billion. They've printed 42 billion Tether in like six months. And are all those Tethers backed? Is Tether unbacked? Well, I don't want to say too much, right? I'll let you decide. I have my opinions on it. But either way, this story clearly isn't finished. Now, the last revelation we need to talk about in this whole debacle has to be the infamous pie chart Tether released, revealing their reserves breakdown for the first time. Previously, they had hidden what their Tethers were backed by after they left the dollar standard. But because of the New York Attorney General's settlement agreement, they had to publish this. They were forced to. Other people have done full breakdowns of what all this means, but the big headline here is that Tether has, according to them, huge amounts of what they call um, commercial paper. 49% of their total reserves, to be precise. Real quick, by the way, I know the number you're seeing says 65% for commercial paper, but that's a breakdown of the cash or cash equivalents, which only makes up 75% of Tether's reserves. So in Tether's total reserves, commercial paper makes up a total of 49%, which is 75% of 65%. I know the way they presented it is confusing, so I just wanted to clarify. What is commercial paper, says everyone in the room? Uh, well, it's unsecured debt. It's debt that if they default on it, you don't have collateral. So in theory, I believe commercial paper is supposed to be only lent to like A-rated um, institutions. Like you're, you're gonna give it to like Apple or Microsoft or you know someone you can trust to not fail because your debt is unbacked. But who is Tether giving that money to? We simply have no idea. 49% of $60 billion, which is roughly um, way more than any human can ever spend. Theoretically, Tether could almost lend anyone unsecured debt, get an IOU, and according to them, that Tether would be backed. Meanwhile, how much actual cash on hand does Tether have? Just about 3%. Pretty incredible for a company that claimed only a short while ago that it was uh, always one-to-one -one backed by traditional currency held in our reserves. Now every Tether is backed one to 0.03 by traditional currency held in its reserves. But now that you're up to speed on Tether and their history, maybe it's time to stop talking about the past and instead talk about the future and its implications. And this comes to the opinion part. These are my thoughts, okay? So this is not fact here. Two things seem true to me. Tether leadership often lie and have a long history of being shady. The second thing is that Tether's absolutely massive. It has passed PayPal in how much money they're actually holding. Not only that, according to the Financial Times, Tether's commercial paper holdings immediately place it as, quote, one of the world's largest investors in the U.S. commercial paper market, rubbing shoulders with the likes of fund managers Vanguard and BlackRock, and dwarfing the investments of tech giants like Google and Apple. Another quote further down the article is even more alarming. Quote, until last week, we really hadn't heard of them, said a trader at a large bank. It was news to us. To put Tether's absurd size in another way that illustrates how weird this is, they are currently the biggest company in the world in terms of assets per employee in the world by far. According to LinkedIn, Tether has 13 employees, but 62 billion under management. That's almost $5 billion per employee. Literally, it is the biggest fintech company in existence right now. Tether is huge, which leads to an kind of obvious conclusion. If it's fraud, big if, it's going to be really, 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 really bad. 
how bad? I mean, it's hard to know. Crypto influencers, mostly, you know, the FUD ones, uh, try to very hard to paint a rosy picture, pointing out that even if Tether's 100% unbacked, Tether is only worth 60 billion compared to the entire crypto market, which is like 2 trillion. And they would say, you just kind of take two, 60 billion out of 2 trillion, it's not that much. However, due to Tether's special role in the market, I'm not sure I agree. Tether's collapse isn't just about 60 billion winking out of existence because Tether is the number one medium of exchange for people to get in and out of crypto, which means when that liquidity suddenly disappears, it's gonna be a lot worse than people think. Will Bitcoin and crypto survive? Yeah, probably. Will it be pretty? Will it be just $60 billion? Probably not. Now, of course, there are alternate timelines to consider as well. You know, maybe Tether never collapses. Maybe after years of incompetence, lies and deceit, they righted the ship. They, they're, they're changed people. Only time will tell. But just don't say I didn't warn you. Well, did you tell them? I tried to. What now? Now, we wait. I know what you mean. This ain't what it seemed. Nothing but a trick trying to sell me on a dream. But that was where you lost me. Wake up and smell the coffee.